Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer from Austin B Media. I am here with uh, Elvar and my mind blanked, um, but the star of It Hatch, um, which will be screening at the Austin Film Festival as part of the opening night film at the, um, oh, I think it's screening at St. David's at 10.30 p.m. Uh, on October mm -hmm. 21st, and then again on October 25th at the Galaxy Highlands fifth screen. And mm -hmm. if you can't make it there, it's screening virtually via the Eventive platform uh, for the duration yeah. of the festival. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if it goes from 24th through the 28th or 21st through the 28th. I don't. Uh, I, I'm not sure either, but yeah. But, but it's, it, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you can't, you can't catch it virtually. I, I'm not sure if it, um, it's uh, available throughout the festival or not, but yeah, on Eventive. Uh, but to kind of um, sum up this film, I think um, it hatched as kind of Rosemary's baby, but weird is kind of how I would describe it. I, I was texting somebody while I was watching it, and I'm like, she's, and she was like, what, what is it like? And I'm like, well, it's kind of like if you took Rosemary's baby and just made it weird. Um, not in a bad way, mind you. Uh, it's just very much just a very, I, I feel like I say this a lot in a lot of my interviews for Austin Film Festival, but um, it seems like a lot of the films I'm covering are just weird, um, okay. which I love, <laughs> by the way. Um, yeah. But I guess in your own words, either one of you, um, what, do you what would you say this movie is about? I think it's a movie about uh, bad communication and parenting, but it's uh, it's also a monster movie per se. It's it's a it's a uh, it in, well we have uh, an ancient Icelandic demon in it, and it's loosely based on an old Icelandic folk tale. Okay, but it has a twist. Um, we have a uh, woman that lays an egg and a baby, a human baby that hatches from the egg. Yeah, and you know, it kind of reminds me of the um, alien um, era egg, mm -hmm. um, especially in how it looks. Um, yeah. It's very, like, it, it's this very interesting thing because it's just like, you, you, I watched it and you're like, oh, something's normal and then you're like oh no it, it's really not um it just takes a right turn and was that practical yeah it's all practical yeah because i'm so spoiled these days with vfx i'm like maybe this is vfx and they just kind of put it off to a vfx house or something like that because it looked so much like it looked so real that you're just like, oh, of course this has to be a VFX because that's how things are done nowadays. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I, I appreciated that. Um, and speaking kind of about the visuals, it, it's kind of an understatement, but the light, lighting in this film is just full of color, intense color. Yeah. Um, yeah. And... Um, from a cinematography uh, standpoint, what did you want those colors to represent without giving any spoilers? Um, well, uh, the color scheme of the film is uh, based on the Icelandic sun, really. Okay. Uh, they have the bright orange tone. It. Uh, we never get, well, we don't get complete darkness in Iceland during high summer, during late June or so. Uh, it's uh, and that's kind of uh, I would say it, the darkness is uh, scary. It's nightmares. You yeah. never know what's in the darkness. But uh, the insanity that comes with complete daylight, twenty-four hours a day, is uh, what we well what was us Icelanders find unbearing. Really, 
I said not, not just the darkness, but the sunlight. And uh, the color schemes comes from that, but of course, uh, blood, poo as well, and yeah. big emotions. Um, but since you mentioned, well, practical effects and so on, I mean, we are, and, and Rosemary's baby, we have, are of course aiming for a certain era of filmmaking. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and since we're doing horror, we of course thought about Dario Argento. Okay. And Suspiria, and so on, and the color schemes of just those giallo films, the Argento films, and their uses uh, bright colors alongside extreme violence and extreme emotions. And um, yeah, that's sort of what we were aiming for. Yeah, and you know, um, I you, you talk about influences. Uh, unfortunately, I've never seen any Argento films, so I don't have that yeah. frame of reference. Uh, I'll put mm -hmm. it on the list of shame over there. Um, <laughs> um, because I actually meant to see Suspiria uh, when the 20th yeah. remake was coming out. Um, because I wanted to compare the two. Um, mm. But kind of talking about in, inspiration, um, when the opening, cre a lot of the score um, feels very, I, I can't remember when the Nightmare on Elm Street came, movies came out, but it felt mm. very inspired by that. It, I mean, there's, um, especially the piano parts. I, yeah. I almost paused and was like, did they just rip that from from the Nightmare on Elm Street theme? So I think we were. Uh, uh, when it comes to the music, I, I think I was more inspired by Bernard Herrmann, and uh, I listened to uh, Bernard Herrmann a lot during the uh, editing process of the film, and uh, well, the Twilight Zone, of course, Cape Fear as well. Those soundtracks. So it's more influenced by that, and um, and but it has like a experimental twist, you could say. Yeah, it it almost varies throughout the film. You're like, okay, mm -hmm. in this section, it it very clearly is this era, and then in later mm -hmm. sections, which I won't spoil the vibe, um, mm -hmm. but it goes in a completely different route. Um, it's yeah, almost yeah. like I, it felt like journeying through eras of horror. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, so um, so I, I wanted to ask about the dialogue because yeah. um, okay. it, it's very unique dialogue. Um, yeah. Some may see this and they might think, Oh, maybe this is stilted, but to me, it actually felt a little more hostile, especially when it comes to Peter. Um, mm -hmm. So, what? First of all, what was that about? Like, what kind of drove this choice um, about this very um, almost separate dialogue? This this style of dialogue. Uh, you mean, uh, yeah, the the, the uh, evolvement of Peter. Especially, yeah. Um, I think, uh, as far as script writing goes, I think it's uh, it's supposed to, it's an old to old to horror, like horror films, mm -hmm. but it's uh, also uh, we see it as a sort of an Americana. Yeah. I mean, uh, we are an island that had uh, the U U.S. Army on it for a long time. You we were strongly influenced by the US Army since we had the army base here for a long time. And they so, sort of did a lot of parenting here in Iceland, you could say. And uh, with that comes the American influence. So we had, we sort of uh, are kind of uh, on, a, on an Americanized Scandinavian country. Uh, we are more, we, uh, I think we have more in common with uh, the United States than a lot of Central European countries, and so on. And uh, we have the American dream, which hovered above us Icelanders for a long time. And it's sort of hard to grab the American dream when you are on an island in the middle of nowhere, up north. And um, I think the, uh, the dialogue of the film is influenced 
well by watching another culture from afar and you sort yeah. of want to sort of paint that culture with the bright colors in the dialogue as well as uh, yeah, that, when it comes to filming yeah that kind of you talk about um different cultures um you start the film in nashville but you you swiftly go to iceland and it's this yeah. almost two different tones for the script really because in nashville um peter feels very um just non-existent i guess would say mm -hmm. out of his element mm -hmm. but then you get to iceland and now it's um myra out of her element so mm -hmm. how did you play with that kind of culture clash um in this script mm. Uh, well, I think when a, if an Icelander would watch the film, he wouldn't feel that it was that Icelandic. Right? Fair. And we are kind of, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think we we are trying to see Icelandic culture from afar, uh, just like we're trying to see American culture from afar. We are watching Icelandic culture from afar as well. And uh, are you still there, Austin? Yeah, I'm. I'm still here. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, buffering issue. And yeah, so uh, so yeah, we tried to um, we, we tried to do a different tone in, in the Nashville scenes and the Icelandic scenes. And I think we're also just referencing different horror themes or horror feelings. So when you uh, when you think about how uh, distant. Peter is in the beginning of the film, we are of course trying to sort of reference films that have that theme as well, so. Yeah. yeah. And I guess um, getting to Peter, um, yeah. he, in, in, he is this, I feel like eternal optimist, um, mm -hmm. especially when he first comes to the house where Myra is mm -hmm. this eternal pessimist. Um, mm -hmm. so how, uh, um, anyone can answer this, but, um, how, how did you play with that and kind of introduce that into the movie and, um, and I guess, where did that come from? Um, well, maybe you want to begin, you know, just with telling uh, Yeah, well, uh. I think it's just like a typical Icelander, really. He like uh, we have the saying in Iceland that a red dust, like when everything is absolutely fucked around you. You look at your phone and you say, "Nah, everything will be fine, man." You yeah. know what I mean? And and so maybe just as part of our, our our culture because we're very very tight knit, very small population. We're only like just above three hundred thousand on this island. And so we stand up, we stand up for each other. And, and, and when something goes wrong, you help out your neighbor and, and you know what I mean? So this kind of just spread into us, I think, the, the, the optimism. Yeah, and piggybacking off of that, the store owner and his um, wife, I believe, there's that yeah. sense of community there where yeah. it, it's, um, I guess the wife is just like, hey, I know more than you. Uh, maybe don't do this. Um, <laughs> and it, 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 it's intriguing because it kind of subverts the horror trope where you're like, hey, just get out of there. And it's like, yeah. well, they're kind of already out of there. They, they mm -hmm. just got to get through it, I guess. Um, um, so I, I find that interesting, the sense of community um because it, it it just it feels like a common criticism of movies from um america where it's just like this thing of hey this makes sense do it and it's like well it makes sense here but here's why we're not doing it um, <laughs> and you know um Getting back to the uh, script for a little bit, um, yeah. I, I found some almost delicious irony 
in mm. the jobs Myra and Peter have. So Myra, yeah. Myra is a child psychologist, but yeah, she can't she have a child because of, um. well, I won't say it. Um, um, and then Peter plays a marine engineer, but mm. his uh, little swimming buddies uh, can't swim. Uh, yeah. So, like, I, I guess a lot of that is, like, where does that just, is, is that something that just naturally came up in the process of who do we want these characters to be? Yeah, I think uh, with Myra, especially, it was sort of obvious just because of, well, the theme of the film and um, sort of how it develops and so on. Um, as far as uh, Peter goes, I think um, uh, as Icelanders are a marine nation, or we're, ocean, we're, we're, we're an island, and uh, the big industries in Iceland and the big chances abroad have often been related to marine work. And so marine engineering is, uh, well, an Icelander who would go abroad and maybe would have like um, some, uh, well, you could say some uniqueness that would help him in a way that would be marine work, but, yeah. uh, and, but marine engineering is, uh, well, not, not the manliest of marine work, you could say. Yeah. So uh, that sort of is why Peter is uh, a, mar a marine engineer, but I like the connection with the sperm. A seaman who sits behind the desk. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was trying to find when I was writing the question. I was like, yeah. okay, what's the connection here? And I just couldn't yeah. find it. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and um, let's see, how can I dance around this? Um, Let's see. Um, first of all, how did you resist not making a Greenland joke uh, when he was in America mm -hmm. with the uh, doctor? Where he's like, mm -hmm. I, I could have swore the doctor was going to say Iceland, but isn't there a lot of ice there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because that's the joke we make is, mm -hmm. oh, I Iceland, that's the wrong name. It should be Greenland. Um, yeah. And... I guess um, talking uh, about the baby, uh, the demon baby, as Peter refers to it uh, in the film, which, which man, that creepy smile, that is, that is the thing of nightmares. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but um, so there's this notion um, that babies fix relationships, or maybe yeah. it's even a trope. Um, mm -hmm. so is that something that was part of that folklore that you uh, talked about earlier? Um, or is that something you introduced and said, Hey, I think this would be a good take on this, um, modern wise. Yeah, I think that is exactly right. We're, you are of course trying to do like uh, a film that is based on folklore and, uh, and, uh, and also it's a horror story. I mean, um, uh, Mara is the, is the demon, Mara. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a, a demon that uh, visits you during the night when you're asleep and uh, suffocates you. So, uh, and, and the Icelandic word for nightmare is martröð, which means that the mare is stomping on you. That's the actual word. word and uh, the, well, the English word for Mara is mare. And you have the uh, well, word nightmare. So, I mean, it's, that's pretty open. And, yeah. and I think, uh, of course, we wanted to find like um, a deeper take on it. Uh, or, uh, well, to be perfectly honest, I, I thought to myself, what would Louis Bunuel do? I mean, what would, he, what would he do? Would he do an actual monster movie but, or would he find a different take on it? Yeah. And that's where it's sort of thinking what what is the actual take on this what should be our take and it's an interesting uh, intersection between old and new because let's see if i can dance around this there is a certain thing that happens with yeah. a hole in the uh house that mm -hmm. calls back to you know um 
certain things. I'm, I'm really trying to dance around the spoiler. Um, I'll just say there's a tablet, and mm -hmm. I did not expect uh, that. I, I know there's Icelandic runes. Um, I guess I, I'll just go right into it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's an interesting intersection because we're tr we're seeing a lot of more Icelandic runes in like um, things like get, uh, the new God of War game um, mm -hmm. and other things like that. Um, so it's kind of this resurfacing of the old and new, um, mm -hmm. making the old new again. So I, I thought that was very interesting because you assume it's just this plain Jane kind of thing of like, oh no, this is just like a demon baby, but it's like, no, this is so much more to that. Um, mm -hmm. than that. Um, so I, I'm going to guess that came from the folklore. Um, uh, the rune stone itself. The runes. Uh, the, the runes uh, well, uh, the, we are tr also referencing uh, a part of Icelandic history, which uh, happened here during the 17th century, the witch hunts, or the wizard hunts. And uh, and of course, runes played a big role there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the saying was that runes were connected to well, magic, uh, while uh, Roman letters did not. So runes would have special powers in yeah. some people's minds. Um, but the rune stone itself is actually based on a rune stone found in the USA. OK. A mysterious rune stone that some people Claim bakes, uh, claim uh, dates back to like 14th century or so. Okay. Uh, okay. But uh, a lot of scholars have uh, also claimed that it's probably a fake. It's a more modern stone. So people do not agree. And uh, that mystery always intrigued me as well, just, just because of, well, also the connection to the Icelandic, to Icelandic history and that runes had some sort of magical powers as well. Uh, the rune stone in the USA was pretty mundane, but I always liked the uh, mystery behind it. Yeah. And uh, well, in the film, they find the rune stone, but they're not really sure how old it is. Um, and uh, well, the film takes place in the Icelandic West Pirates, which uh, was pretty rural for a long time. And people out there didn't have electricity for a long time. And therefore, well, uh, Things like folklores and so on still survived, uh, lived a good life up there. And that is actually where most of the uh, witch hunting took place as well, the West Church. So the West Church in Iceland have like a mystic quality in a way. Uh, honestly, Austin, I don't remember the question. I, I talked so much. <laughs> oh, I, I was just talking about the intersection of old and new. Um, yeah. Because. Okay. It is that interesting thing where it comes up again, and we don't hear about these things um, until mm -hmm. a, a story is popularized. Like we know about the runes of protection and all that stuff, but we kind of mm -hmm. in, in America we think, oh, that's you know just over here like the uh, Brothers Grimm or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we don't have enough knowledge of that so um mm -hmm. forgive my ignorance on that part um no no and, no, no, worries, no worries. <laughs> and um talking about the role of peter um it, it it's a very interesting role because you kind of have to sit outside yourself um mm -hmm. and just let the folklore speak through you um so what was that process like, if you want to talk about that? Uh, it's a kind of difficult question. Then. Um, Fair. Basically, um, it was also like um, just mapping down the, the, uh, the evolution of a character through the movie. Mm -hmm. And and basically, without any spoilers, like the ending of the movie was kind of the easiest for me because it was like, it was 
I felt it all building up inside through the way he starts like uh, getting trapped on and pushed aside and and always trying but never getting anything back. You know what I mean? So yeah. yeah. So it was kind yeah. of like a build up and and mapping of the character as well through the evolution. Yeah, especially in a scene in the middle that mm. where they're just settling into the house um, mm -hmm. uh, where they're drinking in the what would be the, I guess the kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot revealed there that I I certainly won't spoil because it's a good scene that tells you about the yes. dynamics of the relationship these two people have and mm -hmm. which really like if you it, it, for a good second you're like okay th look this is me settling into uh who these people are um before mm -hmm. the real stuff starts um yeah and you know it's it, it's so interesting because it's this this the acting is so interesting because it's this thing where it's this evolution and also like paying respect to what happened before. Um, oh, yeah. And I think, interestingly enough, I think it's going to be a thing where I think this will be re rewarded on rewatches. Um, oh, yeah. As modern horror does, where. Um, where I think you'll pick up on things that you maybe haven't. Um, I haven't finished the film. I, I've got seven more minutes left. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's this, like you say, this interesting evolution um, mm. where you see these characters grow or in the case of this uh, relationship, fall apart. Um, mm. And you have to do all this while also kind of taking seriously, hey, there's a demon and a baby. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's got some really dark moments, which I'm sure um, uh, was really difficult to um, film. Um, I'll dance around what they were, um, because <laughs> those would be spoilers. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, how do you deal with the darker sides of these, this film? Um, really, um, because there's some dark stuff that Peter does in this film that really um, is nightmare fuel, um, but lightly, um, like a, I'll just say a bathroom scene. Um, oh, yeah. Is, is kind of what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to disassociate to film those kind of things. Um, or, or is it just this thing of, I'm acting right now, this isn't real? <clears throat> well, it always needs to feel a bit real when you're acting, you know what I mean? It's just, if not, then there's a texture to it, which isn't really real. But then, so basically when I'm, when I'm doing scenes like that, I just need to tell myself what could possibly be going through somebody that that would make these things happen, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I just need to kind of stay in that thought of mind. And then it's basically just acting and acting techniques. And, and then it's cut from Mr. Elbock. <laughs> and it's interesting because for much of the second half, um, you have this kind of blank expression on your face. Mm -hmm. um, almost as if, well, I won't posture to know um is that kind of a shutting off of emotions for peter yeah i would say so yeah 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 definitely it's also like i mean he is also like uh starting to uh, he starts to uh not believe in his own feelings and and he he, he he just kind of he's lost in everything because like to myra everything is so normal mm -hmm. to him it's sick and 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 so he kind of starts yeah has this belief in his own thoughts you know what i mean so it's kind of like yeah that kind of shut down as well it's just like am, am i really here or what is happening yeah and that kind of brings up a, a different question um moving from nashville 
um, to Iceland, hmm. I, I, I don't like posturing about these things, but I posture about them anyway. Um, but um, what made Peter move to the USA, if you want to, uh, if you had to brainstorm? Well, we... <laughs> Something think we talked about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was studying there probably and just got stuck in his work behind his desk, like, and was living this dull life without really realizing it, just kind of floating through life. Okay. And then he gets back to Iceland and he's, he's back in his element. Okay. Yeah, because it's just like this thing where you're just wondering. He's very proud of his Icelandic heritage. I mean, oh, yeah. when they first. Uh, um, I forget where it takes place, but Myra and Peter are talking about like, uh, I think about the location of the house. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a small moment where it's just like, Myra's like, hey, where's the store? And you're like, yeah, it's probably like, I think you say 400 kilometers away or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then it cuts to this wide shot of nothing but grass. Um, <laughs> So it's this wonderful moment where uh, Peter, again, it's talking about that relationship dynamic where Peter's like, this is fine. And then Myra's like, but is it? We have no furniture. Um, and for as horrific as the movie is, it's actually kind of funny at points. It's, it's yeah, like, hopefully. <laughs> which, yeah. I, I will say that those moments succeeded, especially, well, I won't spoil all the funny bits, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, um, uh, but I, I wanted to ask, this is outside of the film, I just kind of wanted to ask this because, um, so we're heading to award season here soon. And yeah. I, I heard this week that the A24 movie, Lamb, has been selected for the Oscars. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, um, how, how do you feel about having an Icelandic uh, film come to the Oscars for, I, I, I don't know how long it's been, but it's gotta be some kind of achievement. I think 1990, I think. Yeah. 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 I think that was yeah. the last yeah, yeah, yeah. nominated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's excellent. Wow. I think uh, the operation of Icelandic filmmaking is just oh, yeah. great. It's, uh, it's like like I also told you earlier. I mean, the population here is just over three hundred thousand, so I mean, it's a big thing. Definitely. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No. Like I said earlier, the population here in Iceland is only over three hundred thousand. So of course we must be proud of ourselves here. We're doing something right. <laughs> yeah, and it brings to mind, you know, they're starting to be at least since Parasite won back in, I believe, 2019, um, there's been this welcoming of uh, foreign films. Um, like, a lot of more foreign films are playing at domestic festivals, for example, at Austin Film yeah. Fest. Um, mm -hmm. And, like, last year I saw a few films, like Selva Chudika, uh, and um, why do I always blank on this? Um, well, I saw some foreign films there, and that's called the American Film uh, Institute. And, but mm -hmm. they're showing all these foreign films. Oh, and I think they're showing actually as of as of this interview, um, I can go and unlock Petite Maman uh, for AFI Fest 2021. Um, so I just think I, I think it's cool that more foreign films are being accepted uh, domestically um, because mm -hmm. I think prior to that win in 2019 by uh, Bong Joon-ho, um, mm -hmm. apologies uh, if I mispronounce that in any way, um, that there's this infamous quote by him um, that I'm probably going to screw up because I don't remember it. Uh, like once you uh, surpass the barrier of the three-inch uh, subtitle, um, mm -hmm. you're yeah, open yeah. to many more films. And yeah. I've experienced that. So I just, that's 
the reasoning why I ask because I think we're starting to see this boom where not only can um, films from international countries compete with in the international feature uh, category, they can also become best picture winners. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a shame Roma didn't win in 2018 because I feel like mm -hmm. that's that was better than Green Book. But but mm -hmm. anyways, um, that's a topic for another time. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean that that is that could be a whole symposium. Um, yeah, that could be a whole week of talking. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I could definitely see that. Um, but I just want to thank you all for um, both for joining me. It's been a true pleasure. Um, I, I say that after every interview, that but it, I mean it. Um, because the more we get filmmakers on to talk about their films, um, the royal we, um, in the film industry, I think people get exposed to films they ha maybe haven't heard of before. I know personally, mm -hmm. at the Austin Film Festival, I, my inbox is being flooded right now with just all these amazing films, shorts, and I think there's even a few shows in there um, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I wouldn't have watched otherwise, to be quite frank. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I hope get the attention you deserve with this film because I think um, there's a tendency at film festivals just to see big titles, but I think Austin Film Festival is a place to experiment at, to take the big risks and see a movie, a gem that is hidden, uh, so to speak, um, because there's so many. <laughs> I mean, there's hundreds of movies at this festival. I mean, it's one of my favorite par parts of going to a festival is finding that one movie off in the corner that nobody's talking about and mm -hmm. to talk about it. So, mm -hmm. and and another goal with these interviews, um, so uh, I was talking to oh, people behind time now, I really think this should be a conversation between critics and filmmakers because I don't think a lot of people the the behind the scenes stuff where oh what was that choice about uh, this took four years what was that about um, wh where what are your influences what do you think about the state of filmmaking these kind of questions that are important to ask but no one really ever gets to ask because they don't ask mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense but I I, yeah. I think it's a valuable conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, um, and everyone who wants to catch this, um, and if, if you're in Austin, uh, can catch this on opening night of the Austin Film Festival, October 21st at 10.30 p.m. Central at St. David's, and again on October 25th at Galaxy Highlands fifth screen, which I believe are just right next to each other um, mm -hmm. on the same street, I think. But don't quote me on that. I'll have the links. Uh, in the description <laughs> below, um, and we'll all also be screening virtually, I believe, uh, via Eventive. Links to that will be below. But again, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you thank as you. well, Austin. Thank you, and hopefully you enjoy the seven minutes you have left on the film. <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> no, hopefully, yeah. Thank you very much. Hello.